In this episode, we talk about a case involving two men and a goat that highlights the ongoing religious tensions in the country. We also talk about the significance of the first legally binding international treaty on artificial intelligence. But first, we talk about an express investigation into how the Israeli job scheme is now unraveling. Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav, and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. Back in October last year, after Hamas launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, over one lakh Palestinian workers were banned from working in the country. And to plug the labor shortage in its construction sector, Israel launched a job scheme where workers from a handful of other countries would be hired to fill that gap. And India was among one of them. See, of course, the attack was October seventh. That's investigative journalist Ritu Sarin. who reported on the story for the paper and toward the end of last year i think this decision was taken at the highest level uh, in our government also there was a formal bilateral agreement and uh, israel said that they would hire to begin with up to 40000 indian workers and what is important is that indian workers in israel earlier all these years and decades have gone only in the care giving sector there have never been permits or visas uh, work visas been given to indians for the construction sector so in that sense it was uh, unprecedented and uh, israel had of course also augment the shortage caused by the war from other countries but to a large extent from india But this scheme according to an investigation by the Indian Express now seems to be unraveling. Several workers who had gone to Israel for construction work have now been assigned to do something completely different and are getting paid significantly less than what they were promised. The investigation reveals that this is due to glaring gaps in the selection process that often led to mismatch between the skill level of the workers and what was required on the ground. Ritu told us more about this investigation and how these workers were selected in the first place. Yeah, so as I said there was a formal bilateral agreement and while it did not state it so explicitly there were two pathways what we can call pathways for the recruitment and one was G to G and one was B to B. So G to G is government to government and that was sort of handled by the National Skill Development Corporation of the government of India that they would oversee the recruitment and the other was business to business where in Israeli government prepared a list of manpower recruitment companies based all over the country the prominent ones they made a list of 11 who could directly send workers to about 150 or 160 Israeli construction companies. So they would uh, raise the indent arrange the visa the etc that they would fly down for the testing of the workers and the workers would go to israel also through the b2b channel now what happened was that this whole scheme began with the workers arriving around april first batch was b2b and then a huge chunk of uh, g2g and that is where some sort of gaps in skill in the recruitment pattern were first noticed right and we'll talk more about this mismatch but could you tell us how much money they were promised So if you see what actually happened was that the NSDC sort of may have advertised or whatever letters of I mean two state governments if they were interested in this and to begin with three state governments responded that is Telangana Uttar Pradesh and Haryana so these three state governments uh, have had recruitments and about 10000 people have gone and if you see the advertisement that for example the Haryana government put out uh, they said 1.5 lakhs a month and uh, now the nsdc tells us that you know after uh, overtime these workers get overtime they get probably some other allowances plus some things are cut like medical and food and all that but all in all after all this the average uh, that the national skill development corporation is telling us is 1.9 lakhs and the workers who have worked in the gulf or in other countries abroad and who i spoke to are saying that this is like much better than what they have earned i spoke to one worker who said he was earning 28000 a month in the gulf and you know other countries but a lot of workers who have been to dubai earlier dubai is flush with the indian workers in several sectors maybe two three times of what they would get in the gulf and so how many workers ended up going there finally uh 10000 Ten thousand have gone, five thousand each. That is five thousand B two B and five thousand G two G, roughly. And what is important is, which a fact that I did not write, that largely the construction corporations in Israel have been told 
to roughly keep it to 70 30 you know to hire maybe two thirds g to g and then go in for one third b to b and it does transpire that the b to b workers or the b to b companies the 11 companies i told you who have been selected are demanding foreign experience of a longer tenure or making it a prerequisite for israel and probably the g to g people have not done that And like you mentioned, the scheme seems to be unraveling because of a mismatch between the skill level of the workers and what they were required to do. And in your story, you mentioned examples of people like this 42-year-old man named Chote Lal Bind, who took a 15-minute plastering test to be a mason, but who is now working there as a cleaner. And then there was Veenanath Gupta, for example. He took a test in Lucknow and he was supposed to work there as a construction worker But he is now working as a labourer there, mostly carrying loads. And when you spoke to him, he didn't even know where he was at the time. That's right. So many of the workers told me that they have been, you know, shifted from place to place and maybe city to city also, from construction site to construction site. And certainly I have the impression, after speaking to several of them, is that their job profile keeps changing, you know. And that is not what one, maybe they would have imagined. If and I did hear these stories of one worker who I quoted in the story, saying that, you know, even in the Gulf, you had to carry weights and all at construction site, but maybe two, three of us will do it together. And here I am, you know, he, he said 30, 40 kilos, you know, and I have to do it alone. And I did hear from others that a lot of workers are complaining about terrible pains in the backs and all that, you know. Yeah. And now that they find themselves in these situations where they are not suited for the job that they were hired to do and are having to do something else, are there things that officials are saying can be done about this? See, that is the most important part of this story. And that is an official acknowledgement of the problem at hand and an official acknowledgement from Israel that there's a crisis. So, uh, you know, lots of circulars have come out right from the time when there was the bilateral agreement and G2G, B2B and all that. On the 24th of June, thanks to exactly what we have been talking about, the Population and Immigration Control Office, which monitors this, they bring out a circular saying, you know, in the interest of the best bilateral relations, we are taking an exceptional decision to allow Indian workers employment in two, three allied sectors, and that is the infrastructure sector and the renovation sector, you know. So this has never been done before. And in the same circular, they describe how there have been complaints from both ends, from the workers who have suddenly been told in the middle of the night that they don't have a job or who have been told back and like one worker told me and I've quoted him saying that, you know, suddenly the Chinese uh, supervisor or whatever said, go back to India, you know, who've been thrown out of jobs. And as well as from the construction companies who have found these workers unsuitable. So officially the Israeli government has admitted in that long letter, June 24th, I told you, that for three months we are making an exception and we are allowing these Indian workers Workers who are now distressed and, you know, they have no jobs or they've been thrown out or they want to go back to India or they're not keeping well or whatever, for whatever reason, that they can be adjusted in the infrastructure and in the renovation sector. And I also spoke to some workers who said they lost their jobs and they had nowhere to go, but they found a job in a factory or they're working somewhere, or, you know, in Maybe they just found employment. But this provision, I think, is the key to the situation. And this was, uh, as someone pointed out, only for three months. Also talk about the concerns this raises because we understand that Israel has approached India to carry out another recruitment drive for 10,000 construction workers. So the whole intention, though it was not there in the bilateral agreement, was to go up to 40,000. So we have just touched 10,000. What is also important is, I don't have, I mean, it will be difficult to get the precise figure, but B2B companies and, uh, you know, uh, some of these workers, the impression I got also was that thousands, maybe hundreds, I don't know how many, of people who were selected, both sides, B2B and G2G, have not gone to Israel. Because after this situation has arisen, Israeli construction corporations have either cancelled visas of people who were selected or refused to pick them up, you know. So maybe there's a situation where you have hundreds, uh, many hundreds, of selected people for Israel uh, living all over the country who unfortunately have not gone. And that definitely raises a question mark on the reputation of Indian workers, right? Well, all I can say is that I had the top guys in, uh, you know, associations like the Union Association of Foreign Employment Agencies in the construction industry. It's a very important uh, forum. And also the Israel uh, Builders Association. Tell me this, you know. And what are the things that the Israel government or the Israeli officials 
what are the things that they want out of the workers going forward yeah good point so various suggestions have come like this set of suggestions came from the iba itself three things one is don't take in very young people like probably was done for g2g in states like haryana and uh, then in part say a week or two two weeks ideally of training in their skills uh, before they leave for israel and that make it imperative that they have work experience from other countries and this interestingly one of them pointed out was that sri lanka had done this they had sent fewer workers but they had a similar problem of their workers adjusting to israel and uh, of the israel corporations also finding their skills deficient so they had started this thing of uh, you know a rigorous training before departure so these are suggestions that have come in while i was doing the story then another suggestion came which was i thought was also quite useful is that because of this problem of language and uh, you know indian workers what i heard having communication problems with say chinese uh, supervisors to also along with every batch of workers to send one or two people at a supervisory level that would also help And next we talk about a case that speaks to the ongoing religious tensions in the country. On the 15th of June this year, an FIR was filed at a Navi Mumbai police station. This was after a man noticed that a goat was tied to an electric pole outside a mutton shop. The goat was white in color, but what stood out about it was that there were three letters painted on it: R A M, which is of course how you spell the name of the Hindu god. Now the person who noticed this and eventually filed the complaint was a member of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad or VHP the right wing Hindu organization Indian Express's Sadaf Modak who reported on the story tells us what happened next The police filed an FIR against the shop owner Mohammad Shafi and this was under section 295A which is for uh, deliberate and malicious acts intended to outrage religious feelings and also again under sections of uh, prevention of cruelty to animals shafi and two others were named in the fir and uh, following that the navi mumbai municipal corporation also seized shafi's shop and took custody of 22 goats which he was about to sell or was selling and the goats were sent to the veterinary office and the shop was sealed and the fir was filed against shafi and two others what's also important to note is that this incident took place shortly before bakri eid a time when a lot of goats are sold in the market now this case continued for over 2 months and it was only afterward that the police recorded the statement of a man which gave the entire situation a strange twist so after the fir was filed the police go ahead and uh, try to record statements of connected persons and one person came forward whose statement has now been recorded by the police who claimed that he had purchased this goat in question and ram were actually his initials the man's name is riaz ahmed mithani ram so the initials were written so that the goat could be identified to be his since he had bought it and at that time there is a sale of a lot of goats so the police have recorded his statement and are in fact verifying it and trying to look at whether there is any other evidence that points towards whether shafi did this deliberately or whether it was indeed the case of the seller's name being written and it uh, unfortunately being sort of the initials of the dt now taking all this into account sadaf says that at the end of june the court ordered mohammad shafi's 22 goats to be returned to him actually out of the 22 one goat passed away due to natural causes and uh, shafi did not take custody of the goat in question because he has also taken the stand that obviously he had sold the goat to uh, riaz ahmed mithani and uh, therefore that what particular goat the controversial goat if i can say so is currently still at the veterinary office because neither shafi nor mithani or anyone else have taken uh, sought the custody of that goat and the other 20 goats have been returned to um, shafi because the court said that you know there was no proof that there was any cruelty being done by him on the goat and um, also that the initials written on the goat were sort of hand painted which had not caused any permanent skin damage to the goat nor was there any other proof of the goats being treated cruelly and there was one more order by the court in august which said that the seizure of the shop uh, shafi shop was illegal and that proper procedure was not followed by the police or the nmc when it was done and therefore uh, the court also directed for the possession of the shop to be returned to shafi so the police can now either file a charge sheet if they find enough evidence to show that 
Shafi did this maliciously or based on this man's statement and whatever other evidence they get they can submit before the court that this is the fact and therefore there might be no case against him in that case they will have to file a closure report and then it depends on whether the court accepts it or whether it asks the police to continue its investigation and make Shafi face a trial so either it this could like end up with a charge sheet being filed against Shafi or uh, a closure report being filed And in the end we talk about artificial intelligence. Last week the United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom signed what is being called the first legally binding international treaty on artificial intelligence. Officially known as the Council of Europe Framework Convention on Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law, this treaty is being seen as the first real agreement among the key players in the development of AI. When we spoke to Indian Express's Amitabh Sena, he told us what led to it being formulated. So, I think in the last one one and a half years, whoever has been using internet or the computer would have heard the term artificial intelligence or AI. It's become very ubiquitous now. Earlier, also, you had computer programs which had a set of instructions and those set of instructions were programmed into the computer and you would instruct the computer to do some certain kind of things and it would do as instructed now what artificial intelligence technology does is it adds another layer so the instructions are still there the programs are still there what the instructions are also telling the computer is that as you are processing these inputs and as you are calculating or as you are responding to these kind of queries you also keep learning and remember it and learn so you know one of the instructions to the computer now is learn and that is how it is learning and it is giving you more intelligent answers than it could earlier he says that what has made this possible is the significant increase in data processing capabilities you know if we look at a couple of decades probably we are talking in terms of several orders of magnitude so interaction of this kind of processing that the computer is able to do it's because of super fast computer chips that have been developed so the amount of data that it can process is several times more than what it was possible to do just a couple of years ago so now the computer is able to do whole lot of things in a very short span of time and which has now opened the possibility of assigning newer tasks to the computer and which is what is creating a threat threat of job losses privacy violations cyber attacks and of course misinformation especially because ai models can use any source to gather information including those containing statements that are incorrect so there have been concerns about how to regulate you know the development of ai now ai is obviously it's trained on already available data it's not creating its own data it is actually either scoring for data or it is you know identifying patterns and you know based on certain algorithms it is creating similar patterns from what it has learned on already available data now the idea is that whatever it is being trained on is it possible to regulate that you now the development of ai in what forms should it be regulated there are concerns both ways that there can be over regulation which can hinder the development of technology itself or on the other side there are concerns that if it is not regulated if it is just allowed to develop the way in in a very random fashion the way it is happening right now then there are dangers of all kinds including misinformation including you know exclusion all sorts of things can happen because of this and that is what has led to you know this kind of uh, treaty that you just spoke about He says the focus of this treaty is that AI should not violate human rights including those related to data protection and privacy. So one of the things that this treaty asks its member countries to ensure 
is to say that if an AI is being deployed anywhere and there is a an user interface, the people have a right to know that they are interacting with an AI machine and not a person because it can get difficult to identify you know, the way development has been happening. It's sometimes very difficult to know whether you are actually interacting with a person or with a machine. So in all such cases, one of the things is that there has to be disclaimers on these kind of things that, you know, what you see or what you interact with or whether the services that are being offered to you, whether they are being offered by AI or by a person. So that is one kind of thing. Also, you know, it tries to ensure that people's data rights are protected, their privacy is protected. It also ensures that people have a right to know or challenge the information that is being given by the AI. Amitabh says that even though a limited number of countries have signed this treaty right now, other nations can be part of it as well. And while it is limited in scope, the signatories will be accountable for any harmful effects resulting from AI systems. So it begins the process of regulation of AI, right? As I said, as of now, it's quite limited to certain areas as well. But as we go forward and as the AI also becomes more and more prevalent and more and more people start using it and more and more deployment happens going forward, we will see the need for greater regulation of AI because it's such a powerful agent. The kind of potential dangers or threats from it are also very, very high. So it is important that any such powerful agent is not left completely unregulated. I'm sure this is not going to be the last template that we see on AI regulation. In fact, either this itself might be expanded upon or we'll see many more and more global ones coming. As of now, this is more or less European sort of a treaty to which others have also are open to join. But we will probably see much more discussions on regulation of AI going forward. There are already discussions happening, even in Europe. You know, there are parallel discussions happening. Several other individual countries are also discussing regulations on AI. So we'll see. This is just the first step. This is the initiation because it, we are in the early stages of AI development and deployment. So going forward, probably we'll see much more. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.